welcome everybody. Um, really um, honoured to be here, sort of hosting the first um, conversation today. Uh, my name's uh, Dr Liz Sterling um, from Leeds Beckett University and that's all I'm going to say about myself because we're here to talk to these two artists. Um, so the sort of theme was art and life as an artist and um, we've got Sadiqa Juma and Lord Richard Bakwam oh. McLeod. So thank you. Um, you have the longer, the longer name as we discuss. So I'm just going to. Um, oh, that's the short version. <laughs> read out a little bio of each person so that you know a bit more about them before we then um, find out so much more about your work and your lives and all the amazing things that you do. I don't really know quite how you fit all that in, but we'll find out maybe. Okay, and. Okay. Um, uh, they both have work being displayed um, in the marquee, so it's really beautiful to be able to see close up the kind of paintings and the way they're made and very sumptuous experience, so Maybe thank anyway. you. <laughs> so uh, Sadiqa Juma is a critically acclaimed, multi-award winning contemporary Islamic artist, graphic designer and publisher, best known for her pieces Diversity and the groundbreaking Make Your Mark which have each captured the hearts and minds of global audiences. Sadiqa believes the purpose of her art is to unite people, regardless of creed or color. Sadiqa has exhibited globally and her works are owned by royal families, eminent politicians, and hang in some of the most recognizable establishments in the UK and abroad. So, fantastic. And there's some Welcome. in my house as well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Richard, I'm gonna call you Richard. Please. <laughs> Uh, as a ch child, Richard studied Arabic calligraphy in Saudi Arabia under the auspices of his father, himself an accomplished artist and calligrapher who fervently encouraged his son's growing interests. Now, as well as being an Islamic Arabic calligrapher, Richard is an architect, a photographer, a filmmaker, a poet, and a writer. He has a BSc in architecture and an MA in film and documentary making. He has won awards for his photography and filmmaking. So, thank you. Welcome. MashaAllah. <laughs> um, so first, I was just really interested to, for um, you to talk a little bit about the work that you've brought here to be exhibited as a bit of an introduction to mm -hmm. what you're doing and for everyone to know a bit more about uh, maybe how you've made them and what's inspired that work. Of so no, please. You Beauty before age. Um, my work, most of my work is about unity and, and uh, bringing people together. Uh, not only from the Ummah, meaning the, the brethren, the, the Muslim communities, but also the wider communities as well. Um, and I mean, I'm, I've been very, very lucky uh, with the fact that actually the biggest thing that I am particularly proud of and happy with is the fact that my art has started conversations. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, even people who've bought my, my work and are hanging in their homes, um, what they've said is that, um, uh, you know, people want to know a deeper meaning, uh, want to kind of find out what the inspiration, this is the, this is the big question that I get asked all the time. What's, what's your inspiration? But my inspiration is, is, is just us, it's just, what's around us mm -hmm. and just look you know just looking deeper at the everyday and what kind of really really inspires me is that when we go deep into uh, stopping um, and, and, and not taking what's uh, been said out there but being able to see it from yourself we will see the beauty yeah. So mm -hmm. even even when uh, atrocities take place, mm. something good comes out of it because what happens is that it brings the common man. I don't like that word, but you you know the, mm -hmm. it brings us together. It makes us address the fact that things are being done and stories are being told by others, whereas you know these stories need to be told by us, and that's what I. 
think art should do. Mm -hmm. And a lot of my work is about that. It is about uniting. It is about um, looking deeper. It is about looking outward as well as inward. Looking outward and seeing that there is beauty out there and there is so much that we need to be thankful for. Looking inward in terms of, you know, how can I grow? What can I do uh, that will make this place uh, more beautiful? Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's, I'm hoping that that's what my art does and, and I'm sure that art in general should do that. It should be the story that we can tell. Mm -hmm. And it's so interesting from our conversation, Richard, just earlier and then looking at your work, how there's lots of commonalities across yeah. your, both your work mm -hmm. and what you want it to sort of say or do um, and also what you use as that sort of inspiration. Do you want mm -hmm. to... Yes, I mean, what um, I echo what, um, not Auntie, uh, Sadiqa <laughs> said. Uh, and the thing is, Sadiqa and I, and we have a third person, Samir Malik, who is a very awesome student artist. Mm. We kind of agree on this, and that's actually what brings us together. We almost um, have a pack now, everywhere we go, yeah. we'll bring someone else, because we agree on this commonality. We agree on the message that we want to send to the world peace, love, and harmony, in mm -hmm. a way. And we all express it one way or another. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, because of different backgrounds, we have different experiences coming in and then different expressions uh, coming out. But the art is a um, skill, but it's a tool. Yeah. And we are part of this world. We are part of the culture, wherever we are and wherever we came from and we would like to be. Mm -hmm. So we use the art, at our, the skills at our disposal, to express that, to express how love is everywhere in a sense, and not just Hugh Grant and Liz Hurley. Uh, uh, love is everybody. Love is around us. Love actually is everywhere. Uh, and that's what I would like to al always to express, and the harmony that we can have together. So I created the first script the first British script in history, mm -hmm. to present that, to represent that we as a dual identity, it's not an isolated island, which then uh, God knows what happened there. No, we are part of the world and part of a journey that we can all live together and we can have the mm. um, prosperity together. Despite of our differences, one of the major um, success elements of business when you go into a new venture, don't look at what you can't control, look what's unstable, even if it was a couple of elements, and then build on. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's always about how, and I'll, I've worked with the community for a long time, being an asylum seeker myself. We always look for the common grounds and how can we work from there. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the differences, we can coexist one or another. And I think that's the message we always have um, in our work, and I think, most of the audience uh, agree with this. We have lots of commonality which we can, and values Do we can all agree. Do you think art has a particularly unique way of doing that? You know, because obviously music is another kind of form, isn't yes. it? That's very much about that. Yeah. What, what was it that drew you to sort of art and particularly, I suppose, painting mm -hmm. um, and some of the other forms you use to, to express that? What, um, what do you feel that that, is it also your own enjoyment and yes. love of the process? It's, um, it's a language that can be perceived in a non-threatening way. Uh, so it already has an open arms, in a sense, to, so in welcoming um, when you go through the message through the, through the art. So when you talk about peace, if you grow a beard and have a short dress and what have you and say, I'm an imam, and I'm talking about peace, you straight away can have some prejudice. Mm -hmm. But when you talk about peace with art, you cross actually the boundaries um, one of the blessings that I have from the Lord on me, that my artwork, although sometimes it's about Quranic verses, but I get atheist people, atheists, to actually buy the artwork because it's beautiful. Uh, some of the events I participate, sometimes I just write people's names, and people have that artwork because it's their name, and they take it away, and I meet them in different events two or three years later, and say, I still have that piece of art and that piece of art is Arabic and have some connotation with the Islam is being very close to Arabic. 
so that's in a way I express um, that Islam, I refuse to be hijacked by extremists yes. and to be dominated by whoever, whatever tag they put on themselves mm -hmm. and say, this is Islam, I refuse that. And I present a version that I believe in, this is Islam, and we don't go around kill people. We talk about love, there's lots of commonalities that we can agree on many, many values, and that's what I hope that my artwork brings in. Like diversity, for example. We employ color to represent different people, different, different color, different creed, and say we can all be in harmony together. I was thinking, yeah. just when you were talking earlier, Sadiqa, about your wall that you talked about in yeah. London, you maybe um, want to tell people about that. Um, experience which isn't only the color that represents that but actually the people and exactly. other people are taking part in that exactly well when when uh, 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 the, the president across the pond was trying to build <laughs> walls to divide us mm -hmm. um, I worked with an, with an organization called masterpiece who were talking about using the existing walls because walls, uh, in effect, it, it, they're, they're put up to kind of divide us, you know, f the inside and the outside. Mm -hmm. Well, if we can't do anything about that, what we can do is actually beautify it. So um, near London Bridge, uh, and it's, it's, it's uh, interesting, the fact that actually this happened soon after the, the, the bombing near, you know, the London Bridge and so on. There's a wall just by the side of uh, Shakespeare Globe. And uh, I was invited to uh, try and bring people together to create something. So I, I, I basically uh, painted uh, a meadow and invited people to put daubs of uh, paint uh, to represent themselves and to re to, for them to be the flowers that make the meadow beautiful. And the response was unbelievable. And that area there, there's a lot of uh, uh, tourists. Mm -hmm. and. Funnily enough, there's a lot of American tourists who just came and embraced us and said that this is amazing. This is exactly the message that we want to give, and that is that we will not let walls divide us. If we cannot bring them down, we will turn them into something else. We'll turn them into message of peace, message of beauty. And I think this is the beauty of, uh, in, in, in my case, a lot of my work is, uh, is about unity as I've said to you before, but it's also about inviting people to be part of that painting, to be part of the story. And, you know, it, it, it's empowering when they can hold a paintbrush. I've had so many people say, yeah, but I can't paint. You can paint. That is, uh, like, like Richard was saying, it's that, you know, painting is a tool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you, can, you can give that message, you can... Uh, 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 show solidarity in, in so many different ways. And if you can do it in a creative way, it somehow uh, brings people together. It is like, like Richard was saying, it, it's, uh, it's non-threatening. Mm -hmm. You know, what's a paint going, going to do? It's not gonna blow you up. But that's you know? transforming, isn't it? <coughs> it's it transforming. unlocks things in us through that. We were talking it about is. the basin yeah. is yeah. so important. Yes. Yeah. What that allows you or releases yes. in you that's mm. not always yes very much thinking intellectually um, with the sort of all the, the words and information in the world, yes. but how our, our cells and our bodies can you express things. You, you tend ways. to, I mean, you know, when you have a, a, a paint brush in your hand and you're going to put a daub of paint or whatever it is, um, you, it just creates some kind of a, a, a thing in your head that tells you that, well, well, all the rest is really, it's, it's superfluous. I wanted to ask a bit of that because you talk about the way you paint and obviously the way that you paint also, um, it takes a long time often with your paintings and also you talked a bit about a meditative state. Do you, mm. Does that sort of happen when you're painting? Well, there's a, there's a series uh, that, I, that I did uh, and it's called the Shahada, meaning there is la ilaha illallah, there is no God but God. Mm -hmm. And that to me is one of if not, uh, I would say it is, the most significant statement that one can make. And that all this, everything else, is not your God. And this God, whatever it is that God is, mm -hmm. is a God of all of us. There is no God but God. And the way I've done it is repeat 
that statement thousands and thousands of times. And um, you know, my, my, my children always joke, you know, that when one of the things that we get asked, and Richard will, will agree with this, you know, how long did this painting take you, <laughs> yeah. right? Um, and when you ask my children that, when they were sort of younger, or they, they still do, by the way, uh, you know, how long did this take your mom to do? Uh, their answer is, how long did mom not do the housework? <laughs> or mom <laughs> didn't cook, or mom didn't, because, I mean, especially with work like that, it literally, it becomes between you and that canvas. Mm -hmm. It's like um, prayer bit, you know, mm -hmm. the tasbih we call it, you know, la ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah. And you're writing, and you're writing, and, you're, and you lose yourself. It's like, uh, I think the only way, not that I've ever um, danced like, like a dervish, but I, I, the, the only thing that I could describe it I think I would feel is like you know getting into that circle mm. and you're just in it and in it and in it and it's a very very beautiful state mm. so it's everyone quite meditative should it. everyone should experience it's it's a it's a form it, it's in a way I wouldn't say that this is my Islamic faith this is spiritual rather than a man-made uh, name that I could give Islam Christianity Judaism Hinduism whatever it is it is that relationship between you and your maker. Mm. That's, that's, mm -hmm. and, and, and that to me, that is, um, it's, it's quite a, on my part, it's quite a selfish thing. I, I love it. Mm. And hopefully, when you come out of that state, your children Calm. have cleaned the house. <laughs> <laughs> it's highly, highly unlikely. Uh. <laughs> it's highly unlikely. But I'm training my husband to do okay, that. If I so can comment you, on the walls. Yes, go on, yeah. <laughs> the thing is, when we build walls, it's mainly to uh, organize and protect. This is why we build walls in the first place. The problem is it becoming, it's creating the other on the other side. And that's the problem. And then the other, because of the ignorance, it creates the fear, which then end up being with the hostility because I don't know the other person. So straight away on the back foot, try to defend and even attack is the best form of defense. And that's sometimes the problem with the wars. And that's why I love your work, because it brought back the original focus on the wall. It's to protect and organize, but it never to actually create an other person. We all have the right of privacy in family life and what have you, but it's not ever meant to be creating the other and being hostile about them. Yes. So I love this, what you did with the wall. Um, when you talked about uh, meditation, um, I think every artist, um, I think everybody, there's an artist in everybody. Yes. And art is never the form of painting. It could be um, your cooking. Mm. You know, mom is very good cook eventually. <laughs> she never was in my days. Mm -hmm. uh, but eventually became really a good cook. Uh, and that in itself is an art. It could be the way you dress, the way you talk. A lawyer could be an artist. And I did law for a while because I love the word of Smith. But art in itself, when, you, when, you're in that, when you're in that phase, when you're in that solitude with art, I find it very healing. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I went through hard patches in my life. And I went to psychologists and tried to work with them and therapists. And they couldn't give me medication. Nothing worked with me. But what worked is to go and create art. And that was in the form of photography, filmmaking. It took me ages. And painting. That's what really myself is uh, helped me. I don't believe in medication to a certain limit. I believe in art mm -hmm. being therapeutic. Mm -hmm. And that's how I find it in terms. And so I was thinking, because looking at your um, the sort of beautiful paintings, and particularly the Arabic script, which is so precise in many ways, but also so kind of poetic, lyrical. I just wanted to ask you a bit more about how you, um, how you do it, or do you, are you again in a kind of zone when you're sort of doing yeah. that, or does it depend on what you're using? Or? Focus is important, obviously. So when you, when you are in that zone, you need a bit of kind of solitude to be able to get into the zone, whatever gets to you, whether in the background to, to wash out the white noise. Uh, music, Quran, whatever. 
uh, to get you focused. But once you get to that state, and you start producing, and that's with anybody who actually work and produce uh, things. But I had the conversation earlier with Jamila, and she was asking me, uh, how long does it take you, and how much do you go with this? And I said, I, know, I don't know. Um, being a doctor, you know, you spend a certain amount of years, I'm not saying how long. <laughs> <laughs> quite a lot, quite a few. Too long. <laughs> uh, to actually reach that level. And now when you create an artwork, is it, was it born now, or was it in the making all that mm. time? What I find is everything we make is actually born from our experiences, our feelings, our emotions. Everything we did, uh, a movie we watch, a song we listen to, a lecturer we listen, it all goes in to create that. So when you say is, I made this in two days, is it? The skill yes. itself mm, took mm. a few years. Mm. The experience took all a lifetime to create. Mm. So this is as long as it takes. To, to clear that. Mm. But to get to that level of precision, if you like, well, you know, it's a skill mm. and a small motor uh, skills that you have to develop mm. over the years by just the practice and repetition. Yeah, it was sort of interesting because you, I wondered if, obviously you, you learned calligraphy with your father and then did you just do other things and it's something that you kind yeah. of returned to and started doing and it sort of brings you back to that relationship with it was a conspiracy <laughs> i had no chance whatsoever <laughs> we had um we we used to take a part of the curriculum to learn calligraphy in the school so i, I just I had no chance and obviously and i didn't like sport because i always had end up the football in my face i just didn't know how to play football so i did art since i was a kid um my father also was a calligrapher, so I spent a lot of years just watching him le doing the calligraphy. And anybody who would do calligraphy or art, part of developing the skills is actually just watching. Yes. And I was just mesmerized, was watching that, how we do it, just, he's writing. I still can't do that. When I just sit down and writing, I have to get myself in a state where I have to write. Uh, but yes, I end up doing lots of things because when you make money, when you want to make money being Asian, we have to make money. So to make money, be a doctor. I couldn't be a doctor, because I hate the long terminologies. Uh, the next thing is being an architect. It was booming in Lebanon, so I did architect, uh, architecture. And that was one way to make money from design and art. And I, I made money, so my father was fulfilled. And I said, you know what? Now I'm doing what I want. So by the age of 30, um, <laughs> um, we're not going to go on this personal <laughs> level, because I was there. But by the age of 30, um, I decided to change my life. I ended up being here as an asylum seeker by the age of 30. And I decided that it's going to be the start of everything uh, new. So I went and did law, conversion year. And I did law, then I did photography, um, and then I had my break, uh, divorce, and I met my lovely wife Sue over here. <laughs> and I wanted to surprise Sue, so I went to the Newcastle College without telling her and did a massage course, but that ended up being a whole new <laughs> business. And she was learning behind my back Arabic as well. <laughs> so she was sneaking out in the evening. I said, where are you going? <laughs> Says, well, uh, she told me eventually, and it wasn't Arabic because it wasn't my accent. <laughs> um, but I was always passionate and drawn towards design. So I went back into filmmaking. Uh, and I did a few films, and I won awards along the way, so in photography and filmmaking, Excellent. Uh, here and abroad. But then it was painting what really caught me. When I see the watercolor becoming a painting, expressing, you write a word, but then you go, you mesmerize with it, mm. because the word goes beyond um, just one word. But then when you actually then shape it in a way, that communicate on different level, so there's yeah. a visual Absolutely. part of it. So one of the things I do, for example, is I write the word silence, but in a way, the ink is everywhere. So it's, there's no silence, and the painting itself is so loud, the word silence. And that's what I love about it. It's the subtext, which we learn about the body language, about your appearances, about the statement you make, with everything we do every day, whether we want it or not, whether we actually do it on purpose or not, but we make a statement every morning. So when you say, no, I can't be bothered today, and you end up being, don't look good, 
You're making a statement, whether it was cry for help or God knows what. You're making a statement every day. And that's what I love about the artwork and the colors mm. and the imperfection of the lines. Yes. I was thinking about that because obviously there's an, a there's an aspect of painting where you don't have, or maybe you do have full control. There's a sort of conversation going on with the paint. And yes. you've also been working digitally, haven't you? Yes. And I wondered if that's a bit different way of working because you're working through the sort of... Well, I, you know, uh, working digitally, um, it's a tool. The mm. whole thing about uh, painting, which I love, is the, or it can be, the lack of control. Mm. Um, you know, the, the, the mistake. I get, I get asked this, what, what, what will happen uh, if you make a mistake? And I'll say that means that that place will, you know, this painting will be even more beautiful because there is no perfection. Mm. The perfection is Allah, is God. Uh, and then at the same time, working digitally when you have total control, that two things to be able to do both is actually fascinating. And the whole thing about um, art, which I, I do, and painting, which I do love, is actually, yes, you must learn the skill. You must learn how to draw. You must learn how to, you know, because it'll make you, um, that, that discipline is great. But it also allows you, you know, you, once you've learned the rules, it allows you to break the yes. rules. Um, and that's what I love too. So, I mean, my, my background is I'm a graphic designer. That's mm -hmm. what I trained as. Mm. So that's why I'm able to do the digital work. But because I have the training in graphic design I, and with the painting, I'm able to hopefully, uh, you know, maybe the viewer will tell me otherwise, but I'm able to do both. And what I try to do also is break the rules in mm. both because that's where the beauty comes. And I um, thought what was also, that sort of moves me on a bit to um, something I really wanted to ask you about from um, uh, some things that you've talked about, uh, how important it is in terms of um, mentoring people, yeah. which I think probably both of you um, sort of talk about, maybe it happens in different ways, but I was really interested to hear about, you've talked a lot particularly about um, Muslim women artists and mentoring and have you... Well, the, the, the thing is, I mean, I, 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 in a way, this is quite a selfish thing that I, you know, really have a yearning to do. And that is, uh, I do not want to, inshallah, God willing, leave this world mm -hmm. without a legacy. And what do I want my legacy to be? What do I want to do, which was difficult for me when I was going through the journey of being an artist? And that is the most difficult thing for me was to be visible uh, as a woman, mm -hmm. as an artist, as an Islamic artist. And this was quite uh, an arduous, difficult, time-consuming, frustrating journey. Mm. And if I am today able to take the hands of these emerging artists and make a difference mm. and s make Islamic art not be apart from the mainstream but be part of the mainstream that to me would be a job well done and in that instance I mean I we're now uh, I don't know whether this is the the, 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 the space to, to say it, but I, I, I'm going to say it because I think it is important and that is you know the, the likes of MacFest well done this these kind of things need to happen but organizations like MacFest and like other organizations need to uh, put their time, their effort, their money into Islamic art and be able to have a, a space or a venue or whatever it, that, that, that may be to be able to showcase. Now, me, I'm an individual and I'm lucky that I have fantastic friends who are supporting and understand where I'm coming from and where we are all coming from. And I'm in the process of setting up a venture that will address this, that will make Islamic art accessible, mm -hmm. uh, available, and enjoyed by everyone. And this is important. Yeah, yeah. And do you think, is it, is the UK 
particularly resistant or or do you show more of your work I don't think in I other don't I, I or do sh I do show my work globally mm. I don't think uh, I wouldn't say that resistance is the right word to use okay. I think the problem is uh, both within us as artists as Muslim artists because I think what we need to have is a collective is speak from with one voice is have a body that will speak for us. We now have uh, something called the Islamic economy. We're not, you know, we are more than a fifth of the global population, right? And being more than a fifth of the global population means that we have a voice, okay? So what are we doing to speak loudly with that voice? Uh, I'm talking creatively as an artist we're not visible. Mm -hmm. That's the biggest thing. Mm -hmm. So that is a problem that we have to address from within. Mm -hmm. um, outside of this, organizations, galleries, are not really searching, looking mm -hmm. um, to find Islamic artists. So would I say it's resistance? I don't think it's resistance. I think it's just not knowing. So, I mean, really, um, I hope that this is I'm very, very excited with, for the prospect. I'm very excited about the future. I, I can see what's happening globally. I can see what's happening in, in the Middle East in terms of Islamic art in Dubai and, and, mm -hmm. and various places. And I can see that they, are, they want to see Islamic art. I had, a, I had a small exhibition. I'm sorry, I just keep on blabbering about well, it. Well, let Richard no, no. have a sorry. little word. <laughs> uh, just very quickly, we had a, a, a small exhibition which Richard uh, participated in as well, in, in, uh, in Brent Cross. And the response from the general public was fantastic. Mm -hmm. Wasn't small, So there is a need, <laughs> wasn't it? Yeah. There, is, there is definitely a need. Yeah. So, you know, collectively we need to make it happen. Yeah. Richard, do you want to? Yeah. Um, you talked about a really good point. So uh, the, the thing is, for all the creatives out there, this is a word from Uncle Richard. Uncle Richard. We, yeah. Love it. <laughs> we'll have to learn. You'll have to learn. You never take the keys and go drive the car like Uncle Richard did when he was 14 and have an accident for three cars. It wasn't in the UK, by the way. <laughs> um, you'll have to learn. True story, by the way. Um, you'll have to learn. And then, once you learn driving, then you take the car anywhere you want. Once you learn how to use your tools, then you take your brushes anywhere. Once you learn how to, pe how to write, then take your pen anywhere. But you'll have to learn. And, one of, and then you break the rules. And one of the things interesting you were talking about, how we should be, have collective voice, and one of the ventures that's coming, and we're excited about it, it's happening because we have a person who have a very good sound mind, business-wise, on his head. Thank you, Mohsin. <laughs> Big shout to you. Him there. Uh, Mohsin Patel, just to be clear. <laughs> uh, because he can take it forward. The thing is, um, wherever you want to go, it's good about saying, you know, I'm not going to follow the trails of others and I'm going to make my own trail. But guess what? Streets still require lots of logistics. Lots of planning, lots of doing, lots of maybe boring, strenuous, routine jobs before you actually have a road that you can take the cart with. So being an artist, sometimes, you need the assistant of the business side to be able to make money then to be able to produce more, otherwise you'll end up chasing the money and then not creating artwork. Yeah. You still need that business side, and some of us doesn't have that. I mean, I'm lucky because, of, because part of my education, I did architecture, and part of it is we create design, but we still have to be project managers. So you'll have to keep a realistic approach about how can I deliver this crazy design and build it and wreck that building somewhere I still have to think of all the logistics. So I came already into art knowing how can I approach it. And I keep that in mind. So I'm not very diva, to, you know, I'm an artist and God knows what. Uh, because you have to think about business-wise. How can I deliver it? How can I make money? It's the reality. I have to pay the bills. How can I make, I can't go and say, oh, you know what, I appreciate, I appreciate my art. And uh, I have to mm -hmm. sell it. Well, you don't have to sell it. You have to make initiative there. Um, 
And uh, yes, I believe there's no mistakes, there's no accidents, everything. It's in us, we, we try to make an order of something, we try to make understanding, we try to talk about the, the God's plan or the conspiracy theory. But I believe there's no mistakes because every accident happened with you. It's a challenge. But then how can you convert that? Mm. Hassan Masoudi have a, a very interesting approach when he creates artwork. He goes into his um, studio, start doing, uh, creating calligraphy, and he's a very, very good calligrapher. I think he's the father of modern calligraphy because he learned painting and then approached calligraphy with painting and he was great there. And he's still going. But one of the interesting principles, when he paint, now he, as the architecture of that painting, he knows there's a line somewhere that's not in harmony with the rest of the painting. So he make it again, and again, and again, and again. And might end up having 20 painting before he eventually said, yes, I'm happy with this one. But he put all the 20 on sale. Now, my philosophy is the imperfection in the painting correspond with your own imperfection. We're not perfect. No. We're far from perfect. And we know that. I mean, we hide it behind paint, behind clothes, behind uh, social veil, but we know we are imperfect. We know we are vulnerable at some point in somewhere. And sometimes that painting, with its imperfection, it corresponds with us mm. and resonates with us. And this is something artists sometimes don't understand, mm. that that imperfection, because it's about showing the best of it. It's like having your children for Eid, and you dress them to the best behavior, and you never really you know, shout at them in front of people. But when you go home, <laughs> they'll have the smacks. I had loads of it as a kid. But it's about this showing that best, best of, of the version. I do believe that we need to be the best version of ourselves, but I need to, I also believe that we, don't, we shouldn't be ashamed of our imperfection. And I hope that the artwork corresponds on that level as well. Well, it was interesting you were showing me one of your, the small painting in the gold with the... Yes. And how you um, admitted, yeah. <laughs> said there was a sort of smudge, so you then started to paint over that, and then something, a whole new yes. painting had come from that, and how actually those accidents and imperfections yeah open up all sorts of avenues yeah. that you've never yeah. thought of, that they're so important creatively, yeah. don't they? It's like having, uh, I have sometimes the father, my father's voice or someone else, um, but even as a mentor, so when your students come to you and say, oh, I have this, I'm ruined. All right, how can we work with it? If he approaches it as a challenge, how can he approach it? So I was saying to Liz uh, that I made this painting, and it's a painting of al Qudus. And I'm always conscious when I'm painting al Qudus because of all the pain and agony that actually yeah. present. And there's always a problem, if you want to call it a problem, when I paint al Qudus. There's always a problem. It never works. It's like when I sometimes paint my own daughter name, it never works because there's lots of emotions there and they get and interfere. So almost like I want to control something. So when I paint al Qudus, there's always a mistake. So I was painting al Qudus, the idea in my head, the sketch that I have in my in my sketchbook is I'm going to have a, a pink background and the dome of the Kudus is gold and I'm going to put some golden axis around it and then I smudged the painting. Keeping in mind I'm an architect before I'm being a painter and one of the rigid training we do is never smudge your artwork, your, 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 um, your plans and I used to actually draw the plans with a hand so I have really rigid training there but I smudged it. So I start hiding it, but sorry, not hiding it. I thought, well, it's a challenge, so let's work with it. So I created a line, and the line continued and continued and continued, and then the whole painting had circles around it in gold. And that now end up two layers, because you still see the pink, but the gold around it. Now my philosophy, this is the people who love al Qudus. The two people, the, the genuine people who love the Kudus, because to me, gold, I represented many paintings as genuine people, you know, gold being uh, the finest metal. So this is the people. And then I added more lines. But there's a, another thing about it, but it's about working with challenges, because that's what we also teach our children. When a child comes to you with a problem and says, This is a problem, this is a brick wall, I would never live behind it. 
because the one I love never now doesn't speak to me. He says, okay, how can we deal with it? It's a challenge. And that's how I deal with artwork. Before we sort of ask if anyone wants to ask anything from the audience, I just wondered if there's things that you're seeing out in the world that excite you that other artists are doing, or um, it'd be really great to you know, share any of those. I know this was a surprise question that I haven't prepared you for. Oh, <laughs> but, no um, problem. <laughs> Uh, yes, uh, Liz gave us the questions. That's, that's, the, that's the most important thing, isn't it? Surprise us. <laughs> <laughs> Richard. Uh, thank you, but... <laughs> well, we can give you time to think about it and ask... No, I'm things. happy let, to let, answer. Let me, let me tell you what okay. excites me. Okay. What excites me is there is some really beautiful art out there, Islamic art, but what really excites me is the change of attitudes of probably parents who might think it's okay to let their children do art as a career. That excites me, because what's going to happen there is this new breed of people who will come out and think it's okay to be an artist, and that will change attitudes, and that will change the Islamic art world. That's what yeah. excites me. And is that, if it's that specifically, when you were developing your own sort of career as a painter, did you find those kind of sort of barriers, not with your parents, huge but with people sort of saying well, what? When I, was, when I was doing art, because mm. uh, I'm the grandmammy of <laughs> Islamic art, uh, because of my age, <laughs> um, you know, it, it was not the done thing. It was, oh, maybe you couldn't be uh, a doctor or a, or a pharmacist or a lawyer or whatever. So art was seen as if, well, you can't be very clever. Mm. That's why you're doing art. And it was kind of working against the grain. It's, it's, it's that attitude. You always, so I didn't, I didn't go into art thinking, I'm going to make a career of it, right? Mm. And things will change when we will have the next generation who will think that I am going to make a career of it. Mm. Yeah, that yeah. to me would be a win. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. The thing is with the art, um, th there have been studies. I don't claim that I present this knowledge. I've read this. And there were studies to say, one, it, art is needed for, to be a part of the curriculum. And there's been studies to prove that the government, when they push for, push for more math and science, they're actually losing. They're actually losing when they don't push for art as well. Because art is not just in the classical form of painting. Art is also design. So when Apple designed the iPod, there was art there. And the Thumbia University is very proud that the one part of the team that designed the iPod is actually graduated from Thumbia University. And they're now big in design. Calligraphy is art, but making the cars is art. Carlos Gosson, who was uh, the president and the CEO of Lino and Nissan, he actually pushed big time for art. A powerful conversation said they don't need much to actually be support, it's a little to us. But he acknowledged that we need the art in the car. Why? Because 65% of the decision makers of buying the car is actually female. And the females, when they look into the car, they don't know about the technicality of one from zero to 100. <laughs> they don't know about the technicality My of the suspension, <laughs> about the engine, <laughs> about the, these. They don't know that. They look inside the car. I'm a bit of a boy racer. They, they do. They look inside the car <laughs> and see how beautiful it's inside, how comfortable it's inside, how its functionality is inside, and then safety for children. Yeah. One extra thing here for the females <laughs> as well. I said it was actually the females who created the trend of the 4x4 four four cars because they felt protected in the big cars and it became a trend where then now men have those big cars, but actually it was the females who created that. So that's an extra thing. Um, what I'm excited about? I'm always excited. Uh, I'm excited that I had today come with Yesterday, my friend here, Camille, Camille there, uh, the Afghani guy, Camille, Camille. The Afghan, Kamil, uh, he helped me yesterday, uh, taking stuff out. I had a nice conversation with him. 
And he's an artist, to be honest, uh, because once he finished, I didn't ask him. He tidied the car for me. I said, well, thank you. I didn't need to. Um, Jamila, I had a conversation with her earlier uh, about uh, mental health, but she's approaching in a way art. Uh, Kaisara, I mean, she created this, and it's an art in itself that creates all that. Uh, Mohsin, who's a business manager uh, for this new venture, but he's an artist in his approach. Uh, his wife, Asma, sorry, yes, um, she's an artist. Art is around us. So when I did the, the painting, Love Actually is everywhere. It's also art is everywhere around us, if you see it. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm, it excites me. It excites me also that we are part of an era where art is not classed to be anymore is a, a degree for the dump, mm -hmm. for the, the for thick. You don't have to have much of a high score in, in, in your GCC or A level to go into art. And it's being acknowledged. I'm excited that now we have PhDs practice based because then you can do to go to that. And we were having that conversation. You don't have to actually sit down and write this long thesis, which might not, nobody actually would read it, to become, to have a high acknowledgement within your trade as an artist. It can be practice based. It's exciting. Mm. Mm -hmm. Exciting that we have the dual identity. Because for long years, back in the days when Yemenis and Pakistanis and Caribbean came over, and they struggled with the dual identity. They have struggled big time. They didn't know where to go. I came here as, a, let's say, for a Pakistani, where they came over here. And I have certain culture that I have to be abide with. Because that's how I'm geared. That's how I'm actually formed. And they didn't know what to do. Created lots of issues of loss of identity. But now we are at an age that we can celebrate this dual identity mm. with art as well, like any other thing. Mm. And this is really exciting. Thank you. Thank you. Not sure about the car. <laughs> <laughs> do we have any, um, does anybody want to ask any questions? Yes. I have to do it quite loudly, so if it's possible. Sorry. If you draw and say it, and then I'll say it loud. Oh, have we got a... Oh, there's a microphone. <laughs> Do you find uh, any resistance between traditional media and digital media? Yes. Um, there is a, a kind of a misconception that if it's digital, it can't be very good. Um, if you are able to do digital work, that is not taking, this is going to sound awful, but it's not a cut and paste, right? Where if you are able to create art, it doesn't matter if you're going to do it with a digital board, on a canvas, or actually, you know, when you're on the beach, on, on sand. So it's not really the tool. It is that creation of something that has a little bit of heart, that you know, says something more than just, I'll take a clip art from here and a clip art from there. I'll put it together, and there you have it. So unfortunately, digital art has um, a bad name because there's a lot of art out there, digitally produced, that does not require you to have too much imagination to look into it. Yeah, you could, you could easily copy and paste it and create art. I'm not criticizing it, but I, I'll, I'll leave, I'll leave the, 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 your own thoughts into this. The thing is with digital, it's like the whole process of art. Mm. Uh, sorry, the whole landscape of art. So we were talking about just earlier how art is not just the classical style of it in terms of paintings. There's also the wordsmith. There's the own cookery. Uh, art is in everywhere. Now, definitions are important because they kind of give you shape to what's already been known, but the clear shape. And Vizari in the 1700s, he was himself an Italian multidiscipline artist. And he was the first historian in history that he would actually um, document art. 
And he wanted to come up with a definition. What distinguishes an artist from a craftsman or a craftsperson? So the definition was a craftsman who is very good at his uh, trade. An artist who is creative in his trade. Now, once you apply that definition, then you can apply it anywhere. Julia Cameron teaches creativity, and she's based in America. She teaches all around the world. And she applies that principle so she can teach creativity to a banker, teach it to a lawyer, teach it to anybody from any discipline. Because it's never about your tool, it's about your mind. The tool is just a tool that you use to express what you want and depends what you want. Now, from there, you can then say, okay, creative digital can be also creative. Now, there is logistic issues with digital because with uh, the classical type of art, let's say a painting, you have the painting, you, you get it. So if you buy a painting for 100,000, for 200,000, for 1,000, you have that item with you and then you keep it. And that's the logistic issue with digital. And that should not distract from the fact it's still art. And some people, uh, one Spanish photographer, I don't remember his name now, have solved that issue somehow. So he actually sell the photo and say, I will only print 200 of it, and then I will sell it. It's a photo. It's beautiful, people engage and want to pay for it. But say, I will only print 200 of it, and then I'll stop there. There will be 200 versions of it in the world. So that's a logistic issue, but it's still an art. Do we have any more? Questions? Sorry if it didn't entice you enough to actually think about the question. Go on, yes. The microphone. There's a lady. Um, I, I, missed about, I missed out on the, uh, the beginning when you were talking about walls. And I wanted to ask uh, Sadika and Richard, uh, what, how would you comment on the walls being built, built in Germany, in Jerusalem? I've been to that one. And the, the art on the walls. It's amazing, the bubble writing, beautiful. So what's the relationship between walls and artists? Do you want to try? Uh, I would say the walls in Jerusalem, in China, are put up actually as a barrier to one side to the other. When you can't break it down, you will have some sort of um, a way to kind of protest. So those sort of art, a lot of the time, are a way of protesting. But it is protesting in a very beautiful way. Um, I mean, if you look at the, 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 the painting, the, the work on the walls in Jerusalem are absolutely amazing. And you know, the, the, the people who are producing that, the, those paintings, or the people who are living on that side of the wall, are in dire straits. They are in a situation that is not acceptable. But what these artists have done, or what these people have said, is that we will not accept it. We will not be, uh, we will not allow someone to put up this gray monstrosity. We will make a change. And human life is such that when you are in a, in a, in a situation, you will do your best to change that situation. So in terms of the art that are put up uh, on walls that are supposed to divide us, are, uh, in, in my opinion, they are a beautiful way of protesting. Yes. Um, as I was saying earlier, walls originally were made to organize and protect. Now, you can take anything in the world, add to it a bad intention, and then turn up to be completely the opposite to it. So it was put with, uh, I don't know about China, but I know about Jerusalem. It, yeah, it was put with bad intention because I don't agree anyway with the whole concept of Israel in terms of it's illegal. No matter where I come from, the UN have deemed it to be illegal. So the whole entity. And we know about the history, how they moved from one, chunking from one piece to another, to another. there's a history there. But uh, if you want to think of Muhammad to be a scholar, so away from the Islamic connotation and what have you, so Muhammad the Prophet says, you'll have to make a stand. 
where you are, you still have to make a stand. So if you can, do it, change. So if you're walking down the street and you see something that's bad in the street, instead of cursing the people who actually did it, take it off, take it away from the street, and they put on it uh, incentives to say, you, that's a good deed, you'll get rewards for it. If you can't do something, with your, if you can't change with your hand, change it at least with being verbal, verbal about it. Change it. And if you can't change it with your own words, at least your heart doesn't agree with it. So from that sense, people who are able to do something in terms of, well, I can't break that wall, but I actually make a statement. So what's been built to symbol tyranny become actually a monument against them by putting that artwork. And it's collaborative because it's not just Muslims who actually made the artwork. It's people from around the world. And it becomes a statement anti that action. It becomes a statement from all over the world. People actually travel there. They paid money. They paid time. And time is your life. It's the, it's the most expensive currency, time. So they spend part of their lives to go there, risking it as well, to actually make a statement to say, not in my name, not on my watch. This is tyranny, and I'm making a mark to say this is not acceptable. And that becomes a symbol for anti-tyranny. Thank you. Um, I think on that note, I think maybe we have used the sort of time, and I think that's a really fantastic way to end the conversation of a very positive action that be taken and how art can speak yes. um, and how we can all ex express ourselves in forms and work together. So I'd just really like to thank Richard and Tadika again for um, well, thank joining you us. As well. thank you, Liz. Liz thank is you. a doctor and prominent doctor <laughs> and she have really high status. I'm, I'm honoured. <laughs> That actually really <laughs> by Thank Liz. you. So, thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. And thank you for Kaiser and every volunteer who helped making this happen. Thank you so much. Yeah, please and thank make you for sure coming. you see all the work displayed as well. It's yeah. really Buy some of my artwork. Support <laughs> my children. No pressure. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you, you everybody. Much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>